welcome to Autocracy Now. As part of our series on Stalin, this is Episode 8, Before the Storm. On the 23rd of August 1939, the airport in Moscow had been emblazoned with swastikas, the symbol that had become synonymous with both Nazi Germany and with anti-Semitism and racial hatred. An orchestra was playing the German national anthem, which had now become synonymous with fascism. This was no act of sabotage, of the kind that Stalin and his police force had persecuted so many individuals for in previous years. Instead, they were rolling out the red carpet for a very important diplomatic guest, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister. He arrived at 1pm. By 2am, the great treaty he had arrived in Moscow to sign was ready. This was a staggeringly quick turnaround when you consider that the treaty not only ensured that Nazi Germany and the USSR would cooperate economically and refrain from attacking each other militarily, but also included a secret protocol that divided all of Eastern Europe, and, amongst it, the lives and destinies of millions of people, between Nazi Germany and the USSR. Stalin was very happy to negotiate terms with Hitler. He was thrilled to obtain Eastern Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, and parts of Romania as his sphere of influence, while Hitler took the rest of Poland and Lithuania. Just like that, the violent overthrow of these governments was guaranteed. He even proposed a toast to Hitler, saying, quote, He's a good chap, I'd like to drink to his health. End quote. Yet there were reservations to his effusive and glowing praise for Hitler and the Nazis. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, as this treaty was called, can only be interpreted as another one of Stalin's tactical plays. It's not the case that he genuinely hoped that the USSR and Nazi Germany could have a lasting peace where they'd each stick to their own spheres of influence and unite against the liberal democracies that both viewed with deep suspicion. When Ribbentrop proposed that the treaty describe in detail German-Soviet friendship, Stalin was hardly amused. He said, quote, For many years now our propaganda boys have been pouring shit over each other's heads. Now, all of a sudden, are we to make our people believe that all is forgiven and forgotten? Behind the scenes of the negotiations, Stalin's confidence in his chess-playing ability was revealed. At a dinner with some of his inner circle comrades, he'd boast, It's all a game to see who can fool whom. I know what Hitler's up to. He thinks he's outsmarted me, but actually it's I who's tricked him. After all, Nazis and communists had been bitter, vitriolic enemies for years, for as long as the ideologies had existed, almost. The Nazis swept to power, democratically elected power at least at first, at least in part through fear of communism. It had been demonising communists, blaming them for the Reichstag fire, that had allowed Hitler to seize complete control over the fledgling democratic institutions in the Weimar Republic. The Russian people, and Slavic people more generally, were considered subhuman in Hitler's racist ideology. For Stalin's part, the endless set of charges that the NKVD had drawn up against his enemies had always included the charge of being a fascist spy. They had done more than pour shit over each other's heads politically. People had been imprisoned and murdered en masse for the slightest hint of a collusion with these foreign powers. You could not imagine two more diametrically opposed powers. And in a lot of ways it made the liberal democracies complacent. They thought, well, Stalin and Hitler hate each other evidently. They'll just be at each other's throats and we'll be free to pursue our own interests without worrying about a war with them. But now, these two greatly opposed powers were working together to carve up the world. The liberal democracies had been negotiating with Stalin in ambivalent peace talks that had only concluded a few days before, but it was clear that here they'd been beaten to the punch, and there was widespread surprise. Even Imperial Japan, Germany's allies in the war, had not been informed. Now, they were engaged in this on-off border war with the USSR, which, you know, this stretches back all the way to 1905 and before with the Russo-Japanese War, so diplomatically it's obvious why Germany wouldn't tell Japan that they were negotiating but it just shows that it came as a surprise to everyone if they didn't even tell their allies. The Nazi tactic of Blitzkrieg, moving quickly enough that your enemies are constantly thrown off balance, was at play in the diplomatic sphere. But what game was Stalin playing? In some ways, he might have felt that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was his only option. Stalin instinctively felt that he could make a deal with Hitler in order to focus his attentions on Britain and France. Although Hitler's rhetoric had always insisted that communism had to be destroyed, Stalin calculated that the German people would be more concerned with gaining revenge on France and Britain for the humiliating Treaty of Versailles 
Therefore, if Stalin was willing to make the territorial concessions that Germany was demanding, they could strike a deal. It's also important to remember that we look on this era with the benefit of hindsight. No one really knew how much of what Hitler was saying was rhetoric, although seizing Austria and Czechoslovakia made it obvious that he was willing to back up that rhetoric with military might. Stalin and Zanadov, one of his inner circle, obtained a specially translated copy of Hitler's infamous book, Mein Kampf, and they spent hours poring over it, trying to divine the dictator's intentions. We don't need to do that. We know the future. We know that Hitler was going to invade the USSR. We know that the Nazi war machine turned out to be incredibly, devastatingly effective, and that within a year they would have overrun the entirety of Western Europe. There was no precedent for this. There was no reason to expect that they would be so astonishingly successful. After all, the First World War had begun with a German invasion of France that had started well, but then been stalled by the miracle of the Marne, and led to four years that were essentially a meat grinder stalemate. Given this, Stalin probably felt that, even if Germany was in a position to invade the Soviet Union, as Hitler had declared he wanted to do, he might be tied up in the conflict in the West for years. His best move diplomatically was to ensure that Hitler targeted them first. Stalin was convinced that Germany were not going to be willing to fight another war on two fronts which had proved disastrous for them before. And so, even after the fall of France, Stalin was able to convince himself that the Nazis would not possibly consider attacking him until the British had been defeated. This would give him all the time he needed to rearm. It's also worth laying some of the blame for the pact at the feet of the Western democracies. After all, in the USSR they had a natural ally against Hitler, that's why the pact was so surprising in the first place. But the policy of appeasement, ceding more and more eastern territory to Germany, indicated to Stalin that they were not really willing to form any kind of proactive alliance to stop Hitler. Stalin, quite rightly, was convinced that they were trying to ensure that Hitler targeted the USSR first, which from the perspective of western capitalists was two birds with one stone. And when they finally sent a delegation to negotiate, they were low-level officers, Not the foreign minister like the Germans had sent, but an unknown French general, and a British admiral who managed to forget his credentials. The admiral, who had an absurd quadruple barreled surname that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, didn't speak with the authority of the British government, and was effectively powerless to negotiate a deal or guarantee anything. Where Ribbentrop had come by private plane, the British and French had come on the slow steamboats. Another snub for Stalin, who was very unimpressed. He said, These people can't have the proper authority. London and Paris are playing poker again. Perhaps if they knew how well the negotiations were going between the Russians and the Germans, they might have put a stop to it. On the other hand, the British and French governments, with their commitment to self-determination and helping countries like Poland and the Baltic states remain independent, were unlikely to sign the kind of deal that Hitler was willing to sign with a straight carve-up of territory that would sanction the invasion of foreign countries. We also have to consider that Stalin was always concerned with the domestic policy of the USSR above all else. Ever since the end of the 1920s and the destruction of the NEP, there had been an intense focus on maintaining internal personal control. As Robert Service points out, the reason for this is in part obvious. You see, the USSR's ideology is a little bit stuck when it comes to foreign matters, because... In Marxism-Leninism, there's supposed to be some sort of external revolution that takes on the whole world. But uh, the USSR, with its radical communist ideology, it was a pariah state. It couldn't form diplomatic alliances easily with the capitalist nations. Their philosophies were just too far apart. Not when it continued to fund, via the Comintern, communist parties in other nations that were dedicated to overthrowing these governments. It was only really when Hitler came to power, and they needed the USSR as a counterweight, that they were partially rehabilitated as a buffer against the Nazis, and they were allowed, for example, into the League of Nations in 1934. Stalin's outward posture on foreign policy had always been that the USSR was dedicated to establishing socialism in one country first. But this didn't mean that there was anything except the most bellicose rhetoric in his speeches. He said, quote, We stand for peace and for the cause of peace, but we're ready to respond blow for blow to warmongers. Anyone wanting peace and business like links will always have our support. But those who try and attack our country will receive crushing retaliation to teach them not to put their pig snouts into the Soviet garden patch. That's what our foreign policy is about. End quote. 
And of course, these words went alongside the massive increase in armaments production that was part of the first and especially the second five-year plans for industrialisation. But specific means of achieving peace or defending the USSR against its enemies were not Stalin's forte. And the speech reveals that Stalin was fundamentally reactive. There's no grand plan or strategy for establishing world communism, or at least even in the early 1930s, for preventing the upcoming war that everyone feared. Stalin loved reading history, referring to the exploits of old Tsars and Russian rulers. Russia, of course, had a great history of defending itself against foreign invaders, with Napoleon's disastrous invasion of 1812, a ready historical reference on everyone's lips. Hitler himself, before Operation Barbarossa, spent a long time reading about Napoleon's campaign to try and make sure that he didn't make the same mistakes. Stalin also liked to quote the great rational, self-interested statesmen of previous generations, like Talleyrand of France. But, like nearly everyone else, he was taken aback by the speed and ferocity of the Nazi actions. It's clear that Stalin thought he'd have more time and that he could stave off the war. The Red Army had successfully invaded eastern Poland and constructed military bases in the Baltic states, in accordance with the agreement in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This was hardly a great military victory, however, as the Polish forces had been crippled by the Nazi invasion, and they likely weren't expecting to be stabbed in the back by the Russians. Indeed, some of the generals allowed the Red Army to march through Polish territory, having been told that they were going to join the struggle against the Nazis, or that they were intervening to protect Soviet populations in Poland. This kind of sounds a little bit similar to the excuse that Russia uses for intervention today. The Poles fought bravely and valiantly, but with war on two fronts, and the brutal effectiveness of the German army, this wasn't a real test of the Red Army's ability. The purges and repression, however, spread to Polish territory. In a now infamous war crime and atrocity, the NKVD massacred 22,000 army officers, members of the Polish police, and intelligentsia. They killed pilots, doctors, writers, journalists, landowners, anyone who was considered capable of helping the resistance in the Katyn Forest in Poland. This horrific crime was blamed on the Nazis by the Soviet government until 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Only then did they admit that Stalin had personally ordered the massacre, and that Khrushchev had supervised it. Katyn was typical of the mass executions carried out by the NKVD in this time. People would be lined up in front of mass graves and shot, one by one, in the back of the neck with a pistol. There were so many victims that this would often take all day. One executioner, who was infamous as one of Stalin's most prolific hangmen, personally shot 7,000 of the victims of Katyn. To understand the scale of the horror of Katyn, imagine this man shooting one victim every three minutes for ten or more hours in a day. Then multiply that by the 28 days it took him to finish the job. You begin to understand just how awful these events were, and how cheap life was to Stalin and his secret police. All in all, in repressing Poland, a staggering 10% of the population would be deported, with many of them dying in the process. For Poland, there was no respite and no mercy in the Second World War. Despite their ruthless subjugation of Poland and the five-year plans, the Soviet military was woefully underprepared. One of the key reasons, of course, is that Stalin had just purged most of the officer corps and thrown the leadership of the army into disarray. I feel like you can't really have an understanding of why the Soviet Union was so unprepared for World War II, despite the efforts, without realising that the Great Terror had had a great impact on the armed forces. Unfortunately for Stalin, these weaknesses were to be exposed to the Nazis before they even invaded. In 1939, the USSR demanded territory from Finland, which was very close to Leningrad, around 20 miles from the border. A lot of this was old Tsarist territory that had been lost to Finland during the Revolution and Civil War. Now they were concerned, rightly as it turned out, that in the coming war Finland would provide a springboard for the quick capture of the key industrial city of Leningrad. The Finns refused the territorial demands of the Russians, and, after negotiations fell through, the Soviet Union invaded with five armies. Despite vastly outnumbering their Finnish opponents, the Finns fought bravely and with considerable tactical superiority. Now they didn't have any major anti-tank weapons or tank forces of their own, but the Finns were cunning and they mixed alcohol, tar and gasoline together in glass bottles that were hurled at enemy tanks. In the initial invasion, this technique managed to destroy 70 Soviet tanks. The name the Finns came up with for their improvised petrol bombs was a slap in the face to a leading Bolshevik, 
They were called Molotov cocktails. Regularly in the war, we see much smaller Finnish forces, with the advantage of knowing the terrain and behaving defensively, beating back attacks from far larger Soviet armies. The Red Army's clear and callous disregard for its soldiers, with a typical attack on a fortified ridge costing over a thousand dead and 27 tanks destroyed in an hour, was revealed. I mean, they were so wasteful of resources sometimes. More troubling than this, though, were the command issues. The purge had meant that army officers had been selected for political loyalty over genuine military competence. I remember one of the first times I got interested in the politics of my own country was when I heard on the news something about a cabinet reshuffle. And this happens in the UK. Suddenly the guy who was in charge of defence was going to be in charge of transport, and the culture secretary was in charge of the health department. Since then, the education secretary has taken over and is now in charge of health. Now this baffled me for a while. I thought, surely all of these men are working in areas where they don't have any expertise. That was before I realised, of course, that the guys at the top were chosen for political loyalty more than actual relevant experience. Otherwise, the education secretary might have actually done some teaching, and the health secretary might have actually been a doctor. But I digress. In government, this is an issue that stops things from working optimally. But in war, it can be a total disaster if people don't have relative experience. One key example of this is Field Marshal Kulik. He was over-promoted by Stalin, who personally trusted him. Uh, they'd fought alongside each other in the Civil War. They were good friends. Stalin put Kulik in charge of the artillery, because he'd been an artillery commander under him in the Civil War. Even though this was a much smaller job, the personal loyalty was important to Stalin. And Kulik made plenty of mistakes. In the age of Blitzkrieg, as German panzer tanks were destroying everything in their path and revealing the importance of mechanised warfare, Kulik insisted that tanks are a fad. He believed that tanks would never truly replace horses. He's reported as saying, quote, What the hell do we need rocket artillery for? The main thing is the horse-drawn gun. End quote. His anti-tank bias meant that he delayed production of the Soviet T-34 tanks, which were eventually the best tanks of the war. While forward-thinking officers like Tukhachevsky were being persecuted, men like Kulik, who were hopelessly stuck in 1918, were being promoted purely due to their personal loyalty to Stalin. And it's a vicious cycle too, because if you're saying something that Stalin agrees with, then you might get promoted, and he's less likely to listen to alternative opinions. So if your beliefs contradict his, then in fact you're less likely to have them listened to under this kind of system. In fact, it seems as if the purge broke the Red Army particularly badly. Tukhachevsky and his associates, who were most persecuted by the NKVD, well, they were the forward-thinking group that emphasised embracing modern warfare, while Kulik and his cavalry-loving mob were largely left alone or promoted. And it, it, it's odd, in a way, that Stalin didn't realise that Kulik's ideas were terrible, because he was constantly going on about how Russia was being beaten for backwardness, and then to listen to this man who said that tanks weren't going to be a thing. It just seems ridiculous to me. But... The Red Army had also drawn up plans that predicted precisely where the invasion was likely to come. These plans proved to be correct, but Stalin disagreed with them, and the general defensive strategy of the USSR was subject to his meddling. It's fair to point out that actually, the later stages of the war, this trend reversed. Stalin delegated more and more military command to his trusted subordinates as he started to win, and Hitler took a greater personal control over his operations. Such is the way with the dictators. Yet it led to the classic observation that two of the greatest armies in world history were in the hands of military amateurs during the Second World War. Without getting too far into military hardware geek specifics, it's obvious that Stalin's purges were having an impact on high command. Not just in terms of the talent that had been lost, but in terms of what the people who were left felt they could do. People were deathly afraid to report failures or concerns with battle plans to higher-ups, because you might get accused of being a saboteur or a defeatist. Many of the commanders of the army were political commissars with no real military experience. But if you disagreed with them, it could mean your death. Stalin's paranoia and eager willingness to purge the army, even during wartime, was not abated. His constant conviction that failures were due to treachery rather than military reality, his own mistakes, bad tactics or a poorly equipped army, meant that purges continued throughout the war. Consequently, countless terrible decisions were being made by the Red Army, at a shocking human and military cost 
and with no hope that they could be corrected by the officers that remained who had some reasonable experience. These problems would be magnified a hundredfold when the Nazis invaded. Stalin himself would later admit that the army performed badly in the winter war against Finland. Eventually, the overwhelming numbers of the Red Army prevailed, and the Finns negotiated a peace treaty where they ceded some territory. But the Red Army had really been embarrassed on the world stage. One of his key subordinates, Voroshilov, in a bitter shouting round during the war, hit the nail on the head. He said, You have yourself to blame for all of this. You're the one who annihilated the old guard of the army. You had all our best generals killed. Voroshilov, who had personally signed 185 death lists and denounced many of his fellow officers, was being a tiny bit hypocritical here. It was probably only his status as a Politburo member that protected him. Unfortunately, this was one of the few times that Stalin's comrades were willing to be honest with him. But Stalin did begin to take criticism on board, and over 11,000 officers who had been arrested under the purges were freed and returned to military service. Which creates another set of the uniquely tragic human stories that a dictator like Stalin generates, when every little whim he has gets enacted into reality. Imagine being an officer like Konstantin Rokossovsky. He was a brilliant officer, who masterminded one of the Red Army's biggest successes. But he was Polish-born. He must have known how Stalin had devastated his native land. What's more, Rokossovsky had been personally persecuted by the NKVD. His wife and daughter had been exiled. He'd been tortured in prison for three years. Twice while he was in jail, he was taken out with no warning in the middle of the night and subjected to a mock execution. When he first met Stalin after his ordeal and his sudden mysterious release, Stalin noticed that he had no fingernails the work of his torturers. Rokossovsky later told his daughter that the reason he always carried a pistol was that he would not surrender alive if they came to arrest him again. Yet this man was instrumental in some of the key Red Army successes. He served Stalin loyally. But how can you possibly have an army based on trust and loyalty when this is the kind of historical weight that hangs over people? The biggest failure that arose from the culture of terror surrounding Stalin was his astounding failure to anticipate the Nazi invasion. I mean, massing the forces that Hitler did, that's not easy to hide. Stalin's intelligence network was actually rather sophisticated. This same group of individuals in 1940 pulled off the coup that he'd been waiting for. On the 20th of August in 1940, Trotsky, in his endless, hopeless exile in Mexico, invited a Spanish communist, Ramon Mercado, to visit him. Although he'd been hunted for years, Trotsky was still coordinating various international communist groups that denounced Stalin and worked towards a true revolution. He was a dedicated Marxist to the end. His utopian fantasies of the socialist paradise were not diminished by the reality of a Bolshevik seizure of power. Russia, Trotsky had decided, was declared a special case because the peasants were not true Bolsheviks and did not want socialism. So Trotsky was coordinating this meeting with Kada. He looked down at the article that Makada had brought him and Mercado pulled an ice pick out from his jacket and drove it through Trotsky's skull. He was not killed instantly, but Trotsky died shortly afterwards, saying, Stalin has finished the job that he started. And it was not just in distant Mexico that Stalin could make his power felt. There were communist sympathisers throughout Europe and the world, and plenty of anti-Nazi elements who were willing to help the USSR. But Stalin did not trust his security services. He was endlessly paranoid. He didn't let other members of the government and the Politburo have access to the information from his spy network. And he didn't trust the spy network itself. He didn't allow the members of the army to see the intelligence reports even. In just the same way as failure on the part of industrialists was sabotage, any information that conflicted with Stalin's worldview was all too often dismissed as trickery from the British or provocations by Hitler to justify war. It's fake news. Stalin himself seemed amazingly willing to trust Hitler, a statesman who had reneged on every single previous deal he'd ever struck with a foreign government or with politicians in his own country. When at a meeting, the brilliant General Zhukov, about whom we'll have a lot more to say, asked Stalin whether defences along the western frontier should be bolstered. Stalin reassured him. Stalin said, Our ambassador had a serious conversation with Hitler personally, and Hitler said to him, Please don't worry about the concentration of our forces in Poland. Our forces are retraining. End quote. <laughs> Stalin may not have believed this, 
But the fact that he'd make excuses for defending the Western frontier as late as 1940, only a year before the invasion, is shocking. British attempts to warn him about the date of the invasion were similarly rebuffed. He was still convinced that the British were trying to play the Nazis and the USSR off against each other. But even Stalin's own intelligence network did not fail him. He had plenty of indication that the Nazi invasion was coming, down to the exact date of the invasion itself. But, when Zhukov and Timoshenko, key Red Army generals, told him about the array of information that was available, suggesting the invasion was imminent, Stalin threw the documents back in their faces, saying, I have different documents. He was burying his head in the sand, and living in a world of alternative facts at the start of 1941. Hitler had moved only for three million troops close to the border, and even begun aerial reconnaissance flights over Russian territory that Stalin knew about. He dismissed them as provocations. Then, a Nazi deserter with communist sympathies defected, and gave them the plans of the invasion. He was followed by two more, one of whom swam a river to report to Stalin that the order to invade had already been issued. Stalin ordered that the deserters be arrested, interrogated, and shot for spreading disinformation. It's gratitude for you. So why was Stalin so willing to deny all of the evidence? It's hard to say. He was convinced that the USSR wouldn't be ready for war until 1943, and so maybe it was a degree of wishful thinking. He was hoping that he could diplomatically prolong the peace. And it seemed like he was constantly seeking reassurance from his historical readings and his subordinates that he was correct in his assessment of the situation. He was trying to convince himself that he was right. And maybe he just felt that he couldn't back down. He probably failed to adapt to how quickly the Nazis had dispatched with France. Within six weeks, France and the Benelux countries had been completely taken over, which no one anticipated, probably not even the Nazis. Having spent so long insisting on this delaying strategy, maybe he felt it was a sign of weak leadership to change his mind. Did he genuinely have an unshakable personal conviction that he'd outsmarted Hitler? It goes against everything we know of Stalin's suspicious and manipulative nature, and... He's an intelligent man. To think that he would genuinely trust Hitler, one of the least trustworthy figures in history. In later years, he would say that he tried to put himself into the mind of the other person and made a terrible mistake. But his failure to anticipate the invasion of 1941 was one of the most dramatic episodes of his reign, and it nearly cost him everything. The night of 21st of June, 1941, began like any other night. Stalin reassured his inner circle of his conviction that Hitler would not invade. The sycophantic and rather disgusting Beria called it a wise prediction. At 3.15 that morning, the initial German bombardment started. The Luftwaffe bombed key cities along the border, and the artillery bombarded the Soviet defences. Three million soldiers, 3,600 tanks, 600,000 vehicles, and 2,500 aircraft surged across the border in the largest invasion in military history. The war that would determine the fate of the world had begun. The initial reaction of Stalin and his inner circle to the invasion is a perfect, tragicomic illustration of everything that had gone wrong in the build-up to the war. There was an immediate flurry of phone calls between key Red Army figures like Zhukov and Timoshenko. They were terrified of the invasion, but they were more terrified of who was going to call Stalin and tell him that the invasion had begun. This incident seems to have descended into complete farce. Each of them tried to call the front line, which was an absolute chaos. The initial orders were, don't react. Even ordering a counter-attack or defensive manoeuvres was too much for them to do without Stalin's say-so. Timoshenko, amazingly, told his underlings who were telling him about the situation of the invasion to report to me in writing before he was willing to call Stalin. He was afraid that if this turned out to be false, and the army was purged as a result, he'd be executed. Having a nice written report meant that he could blame someone else. All the while, Stalin was asleep. He slept for over two hours before Zhukov called him and reported the invasion. Just a few weeks ago, Stalin had yelled at Zhukov, quote, What are you about? Do you really want a war? Haven't you got enough medals and titles? End quote. Now Zhukov was the only one brave enough to tell Stalin the news. Apparently, when he told Stalin that he was wrong, that the invasion had come, he just heard Stalin's breathing down the phone for the first minute or so, before he summoned his generals and political allies to a meeting. 
even then as the Luftwaffe bombers were pounding the Russian cities. Stalin still remained convinced that Hitler can't possibly know about it. That scoundrel Ribbentrop, he's the one who's tricked us. Stalin issued absurd orders telling the Russian troops not to cross the border into German territory, in case this was a provocation. This order was both politically and militarily ludicrous. The scale of the defeat in the initial invasion was massive. The Red Army would not see that border for years to come. So stunned was Stalin by the war that he gave the task of announcing it to the Soviet people to Molotov, the man whose pact had just been tossed aside. Molotov later recalled, quote, He didn't want to be the first to speak. He couldn't respond like a robot to everything. He was a human being, after all. End quote. Molotov delivers this speech on the radio, but it's not just a standard Soviet propaganda speech. They already start referring to it as the Great Patriotic War. Perhaps Stalin sensed that the loyalty to the ideals of communism would be less powerful than love of country and desire to defend homeland against foreign invaders. That would inspire more people to action than defending communism against fascism. Maybe that was the only calculation got right in the early days. For the first day or two, perhaps, Stalin oscillated between panic and optimism, in the way people tend to do when they don't have enough information, or when new information has just started to sink in. When Stalin would realise what had actually happened, the scale of the defeat on the front. He was unable to process it. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email at us at autocracynow at outlook.com. Follow us on Twitter, like the page on Facebook. Please leave a rating or review on iTunes or your favourite podcast share. That way I don't have to throw paper airplane flyers from the top of the Empire State Building, which is inefficient and impractical and expensive advertising given that I don't live in New York. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, and be kind to one another. Next time, I will discuss the full scale and consequences of Stalin's miscalculation, which surely has to rank alongside the worst military defeats in history. I am going to try to avoid the very serious risk of giving you a full blow-by-blow account of the Eastern Front of the Second World War, partly because other people have done it far better than I can ever hope to, and partly because this is not a World War II podcast. I'm going to try and keep the focus on Stalin, but even so, there's going to be a lot of military history. And I'll talk about one of the strangest episodes in Stalin's life, one that remains mysterious to this day. See you then. Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today, for our episode on Stalin, we're going to be doing episode 9, Barbarossa. So, where we last left off with Stalin, we were talking about the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the diplomatic negotiations that happened between the end of the Great Terror and the start of the Second World War. And we left off in a pretty terrifying situation. You'll remember, all the generals were panicking about who had to call Stalin and tell him that the invasion had begun. There are a few moments in the life of Stalin where things seemed a little dicey for his career. You think about the Siberian exile, when it wasn't clear that he'd ever be anything more than a revolutionary footnote in history. You think about the many dramatic resignations that he offered to Lenin, and when he had to deal with Lenin's last testament, which could have spelled the end of his political career if it had ever got out. You can think about the moment the Central Committee defied him and voted him as a more popular figure. Certainly Stalin viewed that as a challenge to his authority. But without a doubt, all of these things pale into insignificance. The first few days after the invasion were the closest Stalin came to losing his grip. The scale of the military disaster was huge, and such was the carnage and chaos around that it took a few days to be reported. Slow responses on the part of the Red Army proved disastrous. As many as 4,000 Soviet planes were destroyed on the ground due to bombing by the Luftwaffe. They didn't even have a chance to get into combat. And it meant that for the early months, the Luftwaffe had complete air superiority, which was crucial for some of the early battlefields that allowed them to bomb and strafe Soviet cities at will. A pilot, Heinz Nocker, recalled how easy the sorties were for the Luftwaffe. He said, quote, on Russian territory, by contrast, everything appears to be asleep. The scene below is like an overturned ant heap as they scurry about in confusion. Stepsons of Stalin in their underwear flee for cover in the woods. Light flat guns appear. I set my sights on one of them and open up with machine guns in both camp. An Ivan at the gun falls to the ground, still in underwear. End quote. Ivan, of course, is what the Germans called the average Russian soldier in the same way as during the war British soldiers were Tommies 
Heinz Nocker, who told you that account, flew six bombing raids in the same day and didn't encounter a single enemy plane. The German generals had astonishing successes, encircling hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops in the first few weeks of the war. Once your armies and divisions had been encircled, it usually spelled the end. You had no way of supplying them, they had no way of breaking out. This was the case way back when Hannibal beat the Romans at Cannae, and it was still the case in 1941. The Blitzkrieg was exacerbated by a flurry of confused orders from Stalin and HQ, who initially said to remain exactly in place. Any tactical retreat was synonymous with defeat. At first, this was just down to Stalin's disbelief that the invasion had even come to pass. But it played directly into the hands of the German generals and their preferred strategy. Terrified of retreat, but unable to deal with concentrated armour and tanks and the encirclement tactics of the Nazi forces, many divisions of the Red Army were quickly rounded. If they'd been allowed to retreat, these encirclements probably wouldn't have been as bad. Within just three weeks, the Nazis took as many as half a million prisoners of war. With no supplies of ammunition, there was little surrounded troops could do, although this war is synonymous with heartbreaking reports of poorly equipped infantrymen sharing one rifle between them, running in human wave attacks fruitlessly at tanks. Whether this is wider scale as we think is unknown, but it may have happened once. Attempts to counter were often the worst. One instance from slightly later in the war, during the defence of Leningrad, Quote, Altogether, over 135,000 Leningraders, factory workers as well as professors, had volunteered and forced to volunteer. They had no training, no medical assistance, no uniforms, no transport, and no supply system. More than half had rifles, and yet they were still ordered counterattacks against panzer divisions. Most fed in terror of the tanks, against which they had no defence at all. This massive loss of life, perhaps some 70,000, was tragically futile, and it's far from certain that their sacrifice even delayed the Germans at all. End quote. Some troops certainly deserted in the early days, although it's very difficult to trust the accounts of Nazi soldiers, who obviously had their own motives for emphasising how quickly the Soviet soldiers were quitting their posts. For every German war diary that recalls mass surrenders and approaches being welcomed as liberators, there are others who remember fanatical and dogged resistance from the hopelessly outgunned Red Army. The attack had three main thrusts, in the north towards Leningrad, that was St. Petersburg of course, in the centre, eventually headed for Moscow, and in the south they aimed to capture Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Russians. The central front completely collapsed. Andrei Yeremenko, who was there, describes it like this. He said, quote, Having covered every inch of bounds with corpses, the Nazis broke through to Smolensk. Stubborn fighting for the town proper raged for almost a whole month. The city repeatedly passed from hand to hand. More than one German division found its last resting place in the approaches to Smolensk, and in the town itself. Every street and every house was contested by severe fighting, and the Nazis made very every yard of their advance. Hundreds of German soldiers and officers perished in the waters of the Dnieper River. Despite the resistance, the city of Smolensk was taken. Stalin, as ever, knew only one way to answer bad news. He described the defeats as a monstrous crime, and he had the field marshal in charge, Pavlov, tried and shot for defeatism and conspiracy. Pavlov was almost surrounded by the German army when Soviet officials arrived to collect him, but he was hardly happy to see his friends. Done for, was his correct assessment of the situation. He knew that Stalin would be unforgiving. In the early days, Stalin dispatched his most loyal cronies, men like Voroshilov, to the various fronts to try and get a handle on what was going on. By the time they arrived at their locations, though, the war had enveloped them. Places that had previously been forward commands were now battle front lines, and they had to rapidly return to Moscow. The most farcical of these incidents, of course, involved our good friend Marshal Kulik. You remember him, the one who thought that tanks were just a fad and that horses were the thing. Well, he was one of the officers that Stalin dispatched to the front in a desperate effort to try and get a handle on what was happening. Bombastic and thirsty, his idea of good leadership was running around yelling, Medal or jail! at his troops. The man, who was described as a murderous buffoon, showed his buffoonery when, in the early days of the war, he was nearly surrounded visiting front lines. He had to burn his uniform and escape in drag incog on the back of a horse-drawn carriage. Within a week, the Nazis were 300 miles into Soviet territory. Things reached a breaking point with a bitter row between Stalin and Zhukov, where Stalin yelled, quote, 
What sort of a chief of staff is it who since the first day of the war has had no command of his troops, represents nobody, commands nobody? End quote. After this explosion, he sank into despair. Every single one of his assistants records some variation of this moment in their memoirs, as Stalin realised the full horror of the invasion, and murmured bitterly, We fucked it up. Everything's lost, I give up. Lenin left us a great heritage, and we, his successors, have shitted it all up. The next day, he didn't come into work. He shut himself away from everyone, didn't answer the phone, and none of his underlings seemed to know where he was. For all they knew, he could have died in his sleep. And after establishing a system of power where such minute details were dictated by Stalin personally, a system where even taking your own initiative on matters was liable to get you shot, tried for treason, the absence of Stalin created an incredible panic and paralysis in the Soviet high command. The Vojt, the leader, was gone. For maybe two or three days, at the place of the war, at the most critical moment, depending on who you believe, Stalin was cocooned in his house alone. What was he doing? What was he thinking? We won't ever know for sure. Historians portray this in all kinds of different ways. Did the Man of Steel have a genuine nervous breakdown? Was this some kind of alcoholic blackout that incapacitated him for a few days? Some of them like to go with Stalin, even now, playing a Machiavellian game with those around him. They argue that, with his authority challenged, he intentionally withdrew from power in the hope that he would be begged to return. In a sense, it mirrors the dramatic episodes when he'd offer his resignation to Lenin, only to be persuaded to stay. Such theatrics did often accompany Stalin when he felt challenged, and historians also like to note that this mirrors an episode from a historical czar who withdrew from power until his boyars begged him to return. His dominance was therefore reasserted. But personally, I think Stalin probably wasn't playing five-dimensional chess at this point. You credit him with too much self-control to say that this was an intentional pause to test the loyalty of the people around him. It's the kind of thing he might do, but to me it seems far more likely, given how ridiculously unprepared he was for the war, that this was a genuine episode of nervous collapse. After being so disastrously wrong about the Nazi invasion, and with his armies so powerless to prevent their advance, even someone as self-confident and driven by a sense of historical destiny, like Stalin, must have doubted himself in his ability to win the war. In a few weeks' time, they could reach Moscow. It could all be over. And surely part of him also recognised that his actions in purging the army and replacing competent soldiers with party politicians, as well as his failing orders to leave troops in place, were responsible in part for how easy the Nazis were finding it. It was this kind of incompetent personal leadership of the army that had toppled the Tsar in 1917, but Stalin's terror control was absolute. According to Montefiore, for these three days, he just wandered around his Dhaka, sleeplessly, hopelessly. And it's a compelling image for us, because Stalin was a killer, a murderous, monstrous tyrant, who reacted to any perceived weakness by reasserting his power, usually through violence. He was the eye of a terrible, historical storm paralysed by stress and fear, wandering sleeplessly, as we all do when things go badly wrong, through his own personal hell. But this wasn't just Stalin's hell. This was Russia's hell. Eventually, members of his inner circle arrived to receive orders and to coax him out of his depression. There they found him slumped in an armchair, rambling about Lenin and the letters he'd received from the public describing the horrors of the Soviet defeat. Many of the Politburo members who saw him that day were convinced that Stalin thought they had come to arrest him. The paranoid insomniac, in a strange, doomed mood, asked, Why have you come? Berry and Molotov, two of Stalin's closest associates, and therefore those most capable of recognising his moods, personality flaws and whims, because these are the tactics you need to stay alive in King's court, explained that they'd asked him, Stalin, come back to work. Stalin demurred. He said, quote, Think about it. Can I live up to the people's hopes anymore? Can I lead the country to final victory? There may be more deserving candidates, 
Now, in this last sentence, you do start to see a glimpse of the Machiavellian Stalin, using this incident of his nervous breakdown to try and seek out positional factions with his own inner circle. But Molotov wasn't falling for it. He said, If some idiot tried to turn me against you, I'd see him damned. And Barrier, of course, the extraordinary sycophant, proposed a defence committee. You, Comrade Stalin, you will be the head. Barrier's slimy toadying concealed his secret fears. He was convinced after this moment that none of them who'd seen Stalin in this moment of personal crisis and weakness would be allowed to live. Beria's attitude towards Stalin is truly bizarre. He maintains this public posture of intense prostration before his majesty, but in private, he holds Stalin in contempt. At his death, he would hysterically denounce Stalin. He said, Stalin didn't win the war, we won the war. But Beria would never have the courage to be anything other than Lickspittle while Stalin was still alive. The next day, after this rare moment of vulnerability, Stalin returned to Bombast, swearing that the cowards, deserters, panic mongers and fascists would be crushed in a merciless struggle. But Russia had, three weeks into the war, lost two million men, nearly 4,000 tanks and over 6,000 aircraft, a force practically as large as the German invading force, in a colossal series of defeats. The Nazis were jubilant. They had taken France in six weeks, and many believed they would take Moscow within the next few months. In the chaos, Lenin's body was secretly shipped eastwards away from the fighting. Moscow was already fearing the worst. Can you guess what Stalin's response to these setbacks was? For someone who was clearly devilishly intelligent, he really only ever seemed to have one solution to his problems. Increase the levels of terror. Soldiers should be more afraid of our side than of the Germans, Stalin would say in private. He issued an infamous order, not one step back, and personally wrote order number 270. Quote, Anyone who surrenders should be regarded as a malicious deserter whose family is to be arrested as traitors to the motherland. Such deserters are to be shot on the spot. Those who are encircled should fight to the last. Those who prefer to surrender are to be destroyed by any available means while their families are to be deprived of all assistance. End quote. Perhaps then, when we imagine poorly equipped Soviet soldiers who are out of ammunition just running at armoured tanks, the words of this order were echoing in their minds. They could save their families by dying as heroes. Not that Stalin didn't force this order consistently. In July, his own son Yakov, you remember the son he had via his first wife, Ketavan, who died, was captured along with his artillery regiment, Stalin cursed his son for failing to commit suicide and die a death, but he had to carry out the order in the case of his own family. His son's wife was arrested in Gulag, and Stalin's granddaughter was left at the age of three, with neither of her parents to look at her. It's a measure of Stalin's lack of personal attachment to people, and his fanatical devotion to the terror as a way of controlling people, that at no point did this personal tragedy make him think of the lives he was ruining with his draconian orders. When the Nazis approached Leningrad and Moscow, Stalin ordered Beria to hold some men back to man the machine guns. These blocked the entrances and exits to the city to prevent civilians from fleeing. Many of them would later be press-ganged into hopeless, ill-equipped resistance against the Nazis. Forcing them to stay in cities that were doomed, only escalate brought on for no real military or strategic gain. After all, these civilians were now eating the food that the soldiers needed. As so often, though, in the history of the Union, ideological questions were deemed more impracticalities of human life. Stalin's was obeying them was more important than the practicality of human life. Not that the people of Leningrad or Moscow ever got to make a decision. Just as the people of Poland had been, the ordinary citizens of Soviet Russia were caught between two ras wolves. Leningrad itself was one of the worst tragedies of the war. Zdanov, who was fast becoming one of Stalin's favourites, organised defence in true revolutionary fashion from the Smolny Institute. That was, you'll remember, the aristocratic girls' school that had become days after the October Revolution. Zdanov himself, although as hard-working and fanatical as any other Bolshevik, was already showing signs of the alcoholism that would lead to his mature death. During one ferocious Luftwaffe bombardment, his nerves couldn't take it anymore, and he got smashed in the basement wine cellar. Even in the fanatical defence of Leningrad, Stalin saw wreckers and saboteurs, he said, Leningrad will be lost through imbecilic folly, 
The commanders are busy looking for new lines of retreat. This is their only purpose. Don't you think someone's opening the road to the Germans? Again, he just couldn't comprehend that the military defeat was down to their own inadequacy. It had to be saboteurs, it had to be wreckers. That's how paranoid he was as a man. Hysteria on Stalin's part was equalled by hysteria from Zdanov, who orders his troops to burn to ashes the populated areas that they captured. A scorched-earth policy, horrendous in human cost. Hitler, frustrated by the slow process of the advance, made the decision to surround Leningrad and try to starve it out, rather than going for a direct capture. This began the awful Siege of Leningrad, which would last for nearly three years. Stalin's blocking regiments, the men with machine guns ordered to fire on fleeing civilians, meant that two million people were trapped in the city with only intermittent supplies of food. Over the next year, half of them would die. There's a really tragic book that I read recently, which is The Diary of Lena Mukina, and she was an ordinary girl who was caught up in the siege of Leningrad. And the diary, much like Anne Frank's diary, starts with ordinary concerns about her day and the schoolwork and the boys that she liked at school. And uh, as soon as the siege starts, suddenly everything becomes about the war and eventually just about the struggle to find food. And you think it's amazing how quickly your life would descend into the struggle to survive if the city that you were in was no longer supplied. And in that we see her disillusionment with the system, which lied to them and told them that the war was going far better than it was on the radio. And we see as her loved ones die around her and she's powerless to stop it. And you just question how many people must have suffered like this because of the idiocy and the heartlessness of the refusal to allow tactical retreat. Apologists for the Russian communists who still exist and mainly work on downplaying the impact of the Great Terror, they have to answer for that. They have to answer for this ridiculous order. The writer, Daniil Grenin, who was there and who talked to the people of Leningrad, documented an incident where her mother's youngest daughter died. She fed the remains to her other daughter in the hope of saving at least one of her children. This is what happens on the grounds when you issue fantastical orders as Stalin did. The Siege of Leningrad surely ranks as one of the worst hells humans have created on Earth. Stalin's personal orders didn't cease to wreak damage on the army in the initial days of the war. When Marshal Zhukov, the outstanding Soviet commander of the war, requested that Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, be strategically abandoned, Stalin angrily retorted, How could you even think of giving Kiev to the enemy? The wider grasp of strategy was lost amidst the symbolic importance of capital cities. Kiev was eventually taken by the Nazis, with the loss of 700,000 Soviet soldiers in the process. Five whole armies were encircled trying to defend it. Marshal Timoshenko, another army man, had refused the order for a strategic retreat from Kiev, saying, I don't want to put my head in the noose. Inevitably, in the attempt to appear strong, Stalin undermined his own war effort. By conflating any sort of tactical retreat with defeatism and treachery, from the highest levels all the way down, he ensured that the Red Army was terribly wasteful of its soldiers and resources in the days of defeat. Stalin would have done well to remember that the successful defence of Russia in Napoleon's 1812 invasion was mounted on a policy of retreat. The Russians had strategically abandoned Moscow and burnt it to the ground so that the French couldn't stay there. Of course, Stalin was probably thinking of 1812's scorched earth policy when they'd retreated into the vastness of the Russian terrain and waited for the supply lines to become overstretched, when he ordered similar measures taken himself, with results that were terrible for both sides. As German forces approached Moscow, the hysteria within the city reached fever pitch. Stalin, despite the attempts of Berio and others to persuade him to evacuate the city, was determined to stay amidst riots, chaos and food shortages. Some of the government were packed off to Samara in the east, along with Lenin's body. The Soviets went as far as planting landmines in their own buildings, in preparation for bitter, last stand style street fighting. And it should be remembered that that's how people expected to defend themselves against the Nazis. Even in Britain, when they were anticipating the invasion, Winston Churchill came up with a war slogan, You can always take one with you. The idea being that if the Nazis came and fought in your house, then 
you were meant to sacrifice yourself in a noble last-ditch effort. I mean, it was total war that people were imagining. But even Stalin's pig-headed Bolshevik determination was beginning to crack under the strain. Montefiore reports a bizarre phone call, where Stalin referred to himself in the third person. He said, quote, Comrade Stalin's not a traitor. Comrade Stalin's an honourable man. His only mistake was that he trusted too much in cavalrymen. End quote. By this stage, Kulik, to whom he was probably referring, had been removed from important commands. Thank goodness. In these frantic days of October 1941, Stalin was forced to work in the Moscow metro to shelter from air raids. Neither his home in Moscow, nor the Kremlin building where the government ran from, was equipped with a bomb-proof bunker. So he worked in the underground. His staff slept on parked underground trains for a few hours a night, before resuming the flurry of orders to the front. A quarter of a million women and teenagers, with no training or proper equipment, were tasked with frantically digging anti-tank trenches outside the city. Dams near the city were blown up to create artificial floods that intensified the muddy conditions outside Moscow. The fact that dozens of villages were submerged by these artificial floods was neither here or there to Soviet high command. And in a way, it is in this defence of Moscow that the heroism of Stalin as a war hero was really born. The idea that he remained in the thick of the fray during the invasion of the city. But the city was never taken. The attack was slowed by Russia's muddy season in October and November. The Nazis inched towards the capital, but progress was agonisingly slow, due to armoured vehicles sinking into the mud and constant, if wasteful, Soviet counterattacks. Stalin had clearly determined that this was the hill he was going to die on. When he was telephoned by a division commander asking for permission to retreat east, he asked, Does your division have spades? Confused, the commander replied that yes, they had spades. Stalin said, Tell your comrades that they should take their spades and dig their own graves. We won't leave Moscow, and neither will you. In the midst of the struggle, the Soviet propaganda machine never stopped, with a victory day parade on 7th of November in Moscow, involving divisions of troops ceremonially marching to the front. There was singing and speeches. These reinforcements were more symbolic than anything, designed to raise morale in the city and Stalin himself spoke for half an hour, as much as anything, to reassure people that he was still in the capital. German advance units were just 12 miles away. Yet there was something more auspicious for the Soviets in this parade than just a theatrical display of force. Stalin was concerned that the Luftwaffe would bomb the parade as an easy target, but a snowstorm prevented any of them from trying. Winter was coming. In late October and early November, two factors began to swing the battle for Moscow, decisively in the favour of the Soviets. Stalin no longer had the luxury of not trusting his spies. The same spy, Richard Sorge, who he'd denounced for his information about Operation Barbarossa, now told him that the Japanese were planning to attack the US rather than Russia. As soon as he found out the news, a vast fleet of trains rolled from the east, transporting the Far Eastern Army to the Moscow front. Nearly half a million reinforcements and hundreds of planes and tanks were rushed to Moscow. At the same time, in the opposite direction, dismantled factories were being spirited eastwards behind the safety of the Ural Mountains, where they could be reassembled to continue producing war armaments. Soviet terror tactics and the ability to divert whole sections of the economy from agricultural concerns towards the production of arms meant that the USSR was outproducing Nazi Germany in terms of tanks and aircraft. If there was going to be a long war of attrition, the Soviets would win. Alongside this big wave of reinforcements from the east, the Russian General Winter came to the aid of the country once again. Temperatures plunged to unusually low extremes, and, in many cases, the German forces were terribly equipped for the cold, stuffing their boots with newspaper due to a lack of proper clothing. The unusually cold winter of this year only heightened the death toll in cities like Leningrad that were surrounded. The winter caused over 100,000 cases of frostbite in the Nazi forces, and the German tanks had to be heated up for hours before they could even be moved. In some regions, ice made the use of motorised vehicles impossible, and for the first time in the war, the Nazi war machines stalled. Hitler was furious, dismissed his commanders, and took a greater degree of personal control over the armies. And we've already described that there was a notable trend in the war, 
As the USSR started winning, Stalin relinquished personal control and delegated more to commanders like Marshal Zhukov, while Hitler took on more and more personal control. This probably both mirrored and reinforced the changing fortunes of war. I mean, these men may have thought they were military geniuses, but they were not. A counter-attack with the fresh divisions from the east, some of them equipped with military-issue skis, swept the Germans back. The immediate danger to Moscow had been lifted, and the USSR had won their first victory of the war. Unfortunately, the immediate result of the Soviet victory was huge overconfidence and bombast on the part of Stalin. He ordered a wide-ranging counter-offensive across the entire line, a sort of counter-blitzkrieg, like he was hoping to sweep the Germans back in one swoop. Much like the five-year plans, the targets that were set were completely unrealistic for the battered, bruised, and poorly equipped Red Army. But as early as January, Stalin was already planning his massive counter-offensive. Despite the crucial role that Marshal Zhukov had played in the defence of Moscow, and the glaring mistakes that Stalin had made before, he dismissed Zhukov's concerns. Beria was running around, relishing his role in making threats. Do you care about seeing the sun rise and fall every day? he'd say to people. A lack of coordination on the counter-offensive, and the fact that when positions were threatened the Red Army did not make tactical retreats, meant that these offences were exploited by the Nazis. Whenever Soviet forces broke through, they could not consolidate their gains, and generally ended up being cut off in little pockets that were surrounded and destroyed. They weren't ready for a counter-attack. Hitler anticipated where the main thrust of the Soviet counter-attack would come, and cut it off at the past so these were just more men who were surrounded. Stalin was constantly overruling Stavka and military high command. And such was the nature of the terror that there were plenty of generals who could do nothing but sycophantically agree with whatever he told them to do. It's not clear whether he genuinely believed himself to be a military genius, as Hitler did in his later days, but this broad insistence on counter-attack handed the initiative back to the Nazis in 1942. I suppose when you're surrounded by people who constantly tell you how wonderful you are, maybe some of it does start to go to your head, even if you know they're just it. Nor had Stalin's tendency to overpromote his favourites diminished. Meklis, who was nicknamed the Gloomy Demon, had been a loyal perjurer of the army for Stalin during the 1930s. But now he found himself way out of his depth, in charge of a vast counter-offensive in the Crimea. Once there, he was constantly disputing with the general who was in charge, causing confusion about who was really in control as Meklis personally answered to Stalin only. The poet Simonov, who witnessed Meklis's command, described stupid tyranny and wildly arbitrary ways. Eventually, Stalin realised what was going on, and delivered a withering telegram ordering Meklis to take personal responsibility for failures on the front, and he was removed from the Crimea. The worst of counter-offensive was led by Khrushchev and Timoshenko around the Ukraine area, and as Stalin called off the assault when they realised it was another German encirclement trap, but Stalin bristled that military orders must be obeyed. There's a story I've never been able to find a source for, but it's indicative of how high command had been paralysed during this time. Red Army commanders ordering their men, who'd never even seen a river before, to cross the river without boats or barges. When the men tried to swim and drowned at gunpoint, the response was that the important thing is that the order has carried out. The terror paralysis exhibited by members of Army High Command make this kind of ludicrous situation believable in 1941 too. When the Ukraine counter-attack failed, Timoshenko and Khrushchev blamed each other, both terrified of reprisals. In the end, Stalin's capriciousness didn't cost them their lives, but their failure in the Ukraine opened way for his next great offensive. In the meantime, Stalin's own family was in disarray due to the war. Yakov had been captured and was in a prisoner of war camp. Vasily Stalin who had become a drunk, arrogant man, still terrified of his father's shadow, was not allowed on active flights after Yakov was captured. Svetlana, now 15, had been evacuated to the east, where she still sent Stalin affectionate letters, questioning about the war. Why was it taking so long? Which suggests that the full truth of the horror of the front had been kept from her, as it had been kept from so many civilians. For Stalin, though, Ultimately, it seemed that his personal life had been completely subsumed by his political life after Nadja died, and after his children began to leave home. The only person he ever consistently displayed love and affection for was Svetlana, but even this was about to be tested. In the time-honoured father-daughter dynamic, 
when she began to see men that he didn't approve of. The glamorous, intimate network of Bolshevik magnets that used to host glittering parties like the one le- where Nadja and Stalin had their final fatal row had been strangled off by the terror. Stalin's social life, such as it ever had existed, was completely limited to political allies. And of course, everything was dominated and consumed by the war effort in these years. The deeper into Stalin's reign we get, the more enigmatic and contradictory his proclamations become. All the memoirs of the people surrounding him at that time portray him as a guarded figure, oscillating between paranoid, sarcastic and jovial. But very rarely do you get the sense that you're dealing with a person, more of a living, mythical, historical figure. Even in drinking bouts with his associates, the barrier that his absolute power and willingness to kill old friends had placed around him was present, and Stalin made it felt all the more easily for his own ends. He had become an unreachable person. There's an account, shortly after the war, of Stalin drinking with Charles de Gaulle at one of the political summits. He proposed toasts to everyone in his entourage, his friends. Here's Kaganovich, a toast to him, a brave man. He knows that if the trains do not run on time, we shall shoot him. Good Marshal Mikov, let's drink to him. He knows that if he doesn't do his job properly, we'll hang him. That's the custom in our country. When his joke didn't go down especially well as the other allies, he said, People call me a monster, but watch, I make a joke of it. Maybe I'm not so horrible after all. Wearing murder so lightly was a trait of Stalin's after the terror. He and everyone else knew that at the drop of a hat he could set the vast meat grinder in motion again. Such boasting in front of the Allies was a further display of his power. Everyone who attended these conferences noticed that all of the Russians watched Stalin keenly and reacted dramatically to a slight indication of his change of mood, like courtiers of a mad king. But his conclusion for not being so horrible after all was hardly supported when Novikov, the air marshal he joked about, was tortured by the NKVD. Gone now was the depression and guilt about terrible acts if it had ever been present at all. Gone, too, was the ideological fervour, that all of this unpleasantness was worthwhile for the establishment of communism. Stalin viewed it as worthwhile for the continuation of Stalin. He would quite happily go from teasing you about the shape of your nose to joking about having you executed in the same jovial breath. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter, Facebook... Please leave a rating and review on iTunes or your favourite podcatcher. That way I don't have to bribe Apple to force everyone to automatically download the podcast like Bono did with U2's last album. You can even donate to the show if you want to help us out. And please tell your friends, tell your enemies. Next time, the war will turn decisively in Stalin's favour with the battle over the city that bore his name. And death will visit his family again. Until then, be kind to one another. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zinadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at Costa T, that's K O S T A T dot bandcamp dot com. Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today, in our series on Stalin, episode 10, Stalin's City. By July of 1942, Hitler was engaged in another summer offensive, driving towards the city of Stalingrad. Again, Stalin had failed to anticipate where the summer offensive would be coming. He was convinced, partially down to Nazi misinformation, that the offensive was going to come in a renewed push to take Moscow. Just as had happened before Operation Barbarossa, Stalin had some genuine warning of what was about to occur when a Luftwaffe plane carrying the invasion plans crashed behind Soviet lines, but just like before, he dismissed this as misinformation. Stalingrad therefore had the benefit of being a surprise target for Hitler. The city had long been a symbolic one for Russians. Before, when it was Tsaritsyn, it had been the site of Stalin's own victories during the Russian Civil War, and it was now the city that bore his name. But beyond mere symbolism, 
It was also a gateway to the oil fields of the Caucasus, which Hitler needed to capture. He had dramatically claimed that if he did not capture these oil fields, he would have to, quote, liquidate the war. And it's easy to forget that simple resource availability didn't necessarily work out in Hitler's favour. By now he'd conquered Europe and some of North Africa, but both the Nazis and the Japanese during this war were constantly at risk of running out of fuel, with trade supplies from the rest of the world badly limited. Plus, attacking in a region where the Soviets weren't expecting an attack allowed Hitler's preferred strategy of blitzkrieg and vast encirclements to take place. And this was necessary, because even in 1942, the Red Army was already vastly numerically superior to the invading forces. So, attritional attacks around Moscow would have likely made things worse for Hitler, although of course we'll never know what would have happened if the offensive was somewhere else, and if, for example, an attempt to capture Moscow had been successful. When Stalin eventually realised that this was the genuine offensive for the year, in the summer months while fighting was still possible, he dispatched Marshal Zhukov to the front, and finally recognised his ability by making him Deputy Supreme Commander. The battle for Stalingrad is often considered one of the decisive turning points in history, perhaps the decisive turning point of the Second World War. On the ground, there was perhaps no sense of the historical nature of what was occurring. After all, there were plenty of meat grinders on the Eastern Front. The Luftwaffe bombardment and artillery barrages reduced most of the city to rubble, a twisted forest of craters and half-empty buildings. Once again, Stalin refused to let the civilians leave, with an incalculable human cost. Savilyeva was a young girl at the time of Stalingrad, and recalled it to journalists later. She said, quote, The oil tanks nearby had been hit, and the Volga was a sea of fire. The Volga is the river that Stalingrad lies on. Irregular soldiers had burrowed into the side of the ravine, take, creating tiny living spaces, each with a front door ripped from a ruined house. She said, We crouched in the burrow, peeping out. When the incendiary bombs fell, we would rush out and cook potatoes on the flames. When they ran out of potatoes, after that, the family had to survive for three months by eating lumps of clay from the riverbank. She said, It was slightly sweet and I would suck on it all day long. My mother collected water from the Volga. There was blood floating downstream. She would crouch down and skim it away with her hand, and then filter the water into a saucepan with a piece of cloth. End quote. It was the kind of life you'd live if you were left in the city of Stalingrad during the war. More bombs were dropped on the city than on London during the height of the Blitz, and then the infantry came. Young female volunteers of the anti-aircraft divisions outside Stalingrad turned their guns on the advancing tanks. Now, the Soviet doctrine of gender equality proved very useful to Stalin during the war, and many women fought in the Red Army, or flew bombers. One female sniper, Ludmila Pavlichenko, killed over 300 soldiers. She signed up to join the fight in the fourth year of studying history at Kiev University, and after the war returned to her career as a historian. She also lived in the USA for a time. She delivered speeches, encouraging the US to open a second front in the war. She said, quote, I can't help feeling that the American people are still too indifferent to the war and what it really means. I do not believe the American people as a whole entirely understand what war is like. Most of you so far feel it as an inconvenience, doing without gasoline, being a little limited in the amount of sugar you use. You do not know what it is to have bombs falling all around you. You do not know what it is to see babies murdered, women and girls ravished by the Hitlerite beasts. You do not know what it is to find the charred bodies of your own comrades burned and tortured beyond recognition, to see the rows of brave, fine people, people you knew, hanging alongside the roadside. You do not know what it is to walk into a home for old people, one back from the Germans, as I did. It was early morning and the sun was just rising, and we went in to set the people there free. But what we found were the bodies of 108 old people, shot and tortured, slashed to pieces, blown up by grenades. You must learn to hate the enemy as we did. Hatred did not come to us all at once. We are a peace-loving people, and we had to learn to hate. But fierce hatred rose within us when we saw with our own eyes what the Hitler beasts could do. Now we hate the enemy too much to fear him. I have been asked often since I have been here how I feel when I kill a German. The feeling I have after killing a Nazi is the feeling of a hunter who has killed a beast of prey. Every time my bullet fells a Nazi I have the feeling I have saved lives. Only the dead Nazi can be trusted to leave the innocent unharmed. Every Hitlerite killed is a step forward on the road to the liberation of mankind. The Nazi hunters have often stalked me. One duel with a German sniper lasted three days. 
It was a hunt to the death. If either of us had a suspicion that the other had detected his position, that position was shifted. That was one of the tensest experiences of my life. Finally, he made one move too many. End quote. The female bombers and the Russian military, to get around the problem of their noisy planes, would switch off the engines to dive-bomb the German positions without warning. The Germans called them Nachthexen, or night witches, because of their ability to approach without warning. But the women defending the anti-aircraft positions outside Stalingrad were not so lucky. They were overrun, and soon there was fighting in the city streets itself. Dozens of soldiers would be killed in the battle over a single house, a single factory building, a single street. Some 50 Red Army soldiers became trapped in the grain elevator, which would become symbolic of the struggle over the city. When they were asked about the possibility of reinforcements, the response was chilling and typically Stalinist. The Soviet Union thanks you for your sacrifice. It was said that the average lifetime of a soldier coming into the street fighting in Stalingrad was just 24 hours. Helmut Wals was there, managed to survive, and described his experience. He said, quote, He had bomb craters and grenade craters, and nothing else. So we fought our way to the factory yard of the Red Barricade. Schaubel runs in with his machine gun, as if he was on parade ground. He had the machine gun shouldered, and he just keeps running straight. Then he was shot and fell into a grenade crater or a bomb crater. I saw that his mouth was all dirty, and his nose as well. So I wiped that away, and then I said to him, Schaubel, you're seriously injured. And he said, yes, yes, and now I'll be taken back home, now I'll be brought back home. And that's when I saw he had bullet holes and exit wounds, and bullet holes and exit wounds at the back. And you could see his lungs and blood all around it. Goodness, what am I going to do with this man? And I said to him, Schaubel, just stay where you are, we will fetch you tonight, I promise it to you. And then I took away his pistol so that he wouldn't shoot himself, and put his canteen next to his mouth so if he was thirsty he was able to drink. He was reported missing later on, I was told that in hospital. Then I went forwards towards the dugout they were shooting from. Bullets were flying above my head. And so I see Russians in front of me, maybe five metres away from me. So I called out to them to surrender, and they did not do that. So I threw in a hand grenade. And now you can imagine what it looked like in there. One of them came out and he had blood coming from his mouth, from his nose and from his ears. And he pulled his machine gun, the Russian machine gun with a drum at the front. He pulls it into the air and I say to myself, well you ain't going to get me. And I aim my gun at him. And all of a sudden I see little stars. I shot and that was it. I saw little stars in front of my eyes. I look to my right and I ran my left hand over my face and a jet of blood comes out and my teeth flew out of my mouth. It was half past ten in the morning, a Saturday morning. Now it's all over, I thought. And so my colleague saw it and went, Ah! Ah! He crushed the head of the Russian who had shot me. He crushed his head despite the steel helmet he was wearing right into the middle of his face. That made such a cracking noise I can still hear it today. It's brutal, but what can you do? End quote. I think quite often we wonder about, you know, what is the value of my individual life? What am I worth as a person? And I just think sometimes that there are so many people who had the same questions, the same loves, the same fears, the same hopes, the same dreams. And their eventual fate was just to die fighting over some inch of territory in Stalingrad. You'd go into individual houses and see corpses littering the stairs because there'd been a, a battle over who could control the top floor of a factory or a family home. The suffering that was caused was just immense. Stalin personally supervised the battle, paying attention to the street-to-street -street and day-to-day -day fighting, but he did so from his office in Moscow. Phone calls from Zhukov at the front was the closest he got to the war. He slept for a few hours a night on a metal bed under the stairs in his house, and spent 16 hours a day reading reports from the various fronts. If any of his subordinates missed a single report, they would receive a withering telegram. If you allow yourself to forget your duty, you will be sent to the front. The first successful Soviet counterattack since Moscow was launched with Operation Uranus. One of the commanders in charge was Konstantin Rokossovsky, who we mentioned had his fingernails pulled off by the NKVD during the Great Terror. This was Rokossovsky's moment of tactical glory. The Soviet armies crashed through the Romanian armies, who were allied with the Nazis at this time, on the flanks, and eventually managed to encircle the German armies that were attacking Stalingrad. When Stalin was told of the success of this operation, he laconically replied, Carry on.
A German counteroffensive to break the encirclement was unsuccessful, and despite Hermann Goering's boasts, the Luftwaffe could not resupply the encircled troops by air. Now it was the turn of a Nazi army to be subjected to the horrendous, inhuman conditions of encirclement. The last few letters written by the encircled soldiers, or at least the ones that survived, are heartbreaking to read, and made it out on the last of the planes to leave that place. The bone fields of Stalingrad are still there, the remnants of this army that was encircled. General Paulus, who had been in charge of the army that was now encircled, was promoted to field marshal by Hitler. The implication for this promotion was clear, because no German field marshal had ever surrendered or allowed himself to be captured. But Paulus did not commit suicides. As eerie as the fields of ghosts and corpses in the burned-out city, the encircled forces remained in place for weeks, slowly starving to death. Paulus declared, I have no intention of shooting myself for this bohemian corporal. After it became clear that he was captured, it put Stalin in a very awkward position. An offer was made for him to exchange his son, Yakov, still languishing in a prisoner of war camp, for the German field marshal. As Montefiore points out, Stalin had hoped that his own son would commit suicide, to prevent embarrassment, just as Hitler had hoped the same of Paulus. They were analogous people in a lot of ways. Stalin refused the deal, saying, Why would I swap a field marshal for a soldier? All of them are my sons. Was this evidence of his callousness towards a son he viewed with suspicion as just another traitor? In truth, Stalin didn't have that much of a choice, as bad as that sounds to say, and he later sadly lamented. Quote, just think how many sons ended in camps. Who would swap them for Paulus? Were they worse than Yakov? I had to refuse. What would they have said of me, my millions of party fathers, if I had forgotten about them? I had no choice. Otherwise, I'd no longer be Stalin. Unquote. I think it's an interesting insight, because at the beginning of that quote, he's saying, I can't do this because of my compassion for the other soldiers and the other families who've been affected by the war. But then at the end, he does bring it back to himself and his own image in terms of the public perception. And... In some ways, you question which of those factors was more important than his decision. In another rare instance, when his guard fell, he pushed aside his dinner. He said, quote, Yakov will prefer death to betrayal of the motherland. What a terrible war. How many lives of our people have been taken away? We'll have few families without relatives who have perished. End quote. Not that this moment of compassion made him feel any guilt over ordering civilians to stay in war zones like Leningrad and Stalingrad, when they might have been saved, or armies to retreat or surrender when they might have survived. It is worth noting two things before we absolve Stalin and congratulate him on his humanity towards his own son. The first thing is to note that his image and status as Stalin, as Vojt, as leader, was more important to him than his family members. The second thing to note is that Yakov died a few weeks after the victory of Stalingrad. Some accounts say he was electrocuted in what was either an attempt at suicide or escape, while other files say that he was shot by a guard for disobeying orders. It's very difficult to know which of these is true and which is an NKVD fabrication, so I'm not sure we'll ever really know. The most dramatic account, which I can't find a good source for, says that Yakov discovered the NKVD's Katyn massacre in Poland, which the occupying Germans had used as propaganda, and having befriended Polish inmates, committed suicide out of guilt and shame. Whatever the reason, whether he died by suicide or defiance, it rehabilitated him in Stalin's mind. Now that his son had died for the cause, he felt, finally felt that he could be proud with him. The same son that he had mocked after a teenage suicide attempt was now, in Stalin's mind, quote, a noble man right to the end. Dead people can't betray or disappoint you. This kind of attitude shows how far from normal humanity Stalin had deviated in the years of personal tragedy absolute power, and mass murder he had endured since the 1920s. His closest relationships were with dead people. Yet, many people said that Yakov and Nadia forever troubled him in private. The absence of Stalin's personal life in the light of these personal tragedies makes sense. If he had found any emotions at all in thinking about his family, they must surely be pain and guilt rather than any happiness or comfort. There is a certain impression I get from reading the things that Stalin says about his family, which is very interesting. When he talks about his regrets in dealing with Nadja or Yakov or Vasily, or even Svetlana, 
he never talks about it in terms of improving, but almost just the world is set up this way, that I can't relate to these people, that I can't feel empathy for them, that they won't feel empathy for me. He never feels like he has the ability to atone for the things he's done or improve as a person. It's almost as if he's more confused than angry with people. He doesn't understand why they don't love him, and he doesn't understand why there's this barrier between him and others. And in response, he just sort of sadly retreats into his own political life and his own reputation, and almost as if he's accepted being Stalin, the figure, the historical figure, the mass murderer, the tyrant, and not Stalin the man by this stage in his life. Meanwhile, Vasily had been psychologically destroyed by the tormenting presence of his father and his own character flaws. He was permanently drunk, forbidden from any real responsibility in his role as air marshal, but also hopelessly overpromoted. He indulged in classic commodus style debauchery. His Red Army issue revolver was mainly used for shooting at tin cans and chandeliers. In daredevil desperation, and instead of actual combat, he would fly planes drunk. As with all these tales of extravagant debauchery, you get the sense that the person in the centre of that whirlwind of drink, sex, and wild antics is desperately trying to bury their subconscious demons, and there's a self-destructive undertone to the things he did. Drinking antifreeze instead of using it on the wings of his plane, he spiralled deeper and deeper into the alcoholism that would eventually lead to his death aged just 40. It was around this time that Svetlana Stalin, growing into a young woman, began to defy her father. In reading about Stalin, the only person he consistently showed affection for was Svetlana. It was the closest the Stalins got to a functioning family relationship. As a little girl, she'd write to him, I order you to take me to the theatre, to which Stalin would reply, All right, I obey. There are plenty of photos of Stalin behaving affectionately towards her, and everyone who surrounded Stalin described her as his clear favourite. But as she grew older, she must have surely become more aware of the unique, bizarre set of circumstances that she lived in, and the rarefied air that she breathed as the daughter of the most powerful man in the country. Adolescence is typically a time, it was for me, probably for you as well, when you become somewhat disillusioned with the world around you, the rules of the world, the unfairnesses, the injustices, which you're shielded from as a child, become apparent. The grim realities of what human beings can do to each other lead to teenage angst, existential crises, and acts of teenage rebellion. I cannot imagine how much this must have been amplified in the case of Svetlana. Age 16, she discovered from a tutor who risked her life in disclosing the information that her mother committed suicide. Her father had ordered the deaths of men she knew, who they weren't allowed to speak about, and now ran a war of unimaginable brutality. Her brother had been taken captive. Her other sibling was an alcoholic playboy who was terrified of her father. One of her closest friends and confidant was Beria's son. Beria's son could truly understand what it was like to have those feelings about your parents. Svetlana, like any of us, had no choice about the circumstances of her birth. It's difficult to imagine the strain that she was put under in this position. Her relationship with her father would be severely frayed by her first proper boyfriend, the film writer Alexei Kapler. He was more than twice her age, she was just 16. Kapler was sweet and affectionate towards Svetlana, but he was also hardly beyond boasting about the status of his new girlfriend. Stalin, who of course knew everything, didn't have him immediately shot, but instead posted him to the front as a war correspondent near Stalingrad. Amazingly, in spite of the Great Terror, and perhaps illustrating that Kapler's affection was somewhat genuine, this didn't deter him, and they continued to see each other when he returned. Stalin, in response, exploded. Imagine the nature of a controlling father with the entire spying apparatus of the NKVD at his beck and call, who's used to making people that he doesn't like disappear. I know everything, all your telephone conversations, here they are, he yelled, tapping his pocket full of the recorded conversations that some poor NKVD agent had to type up for him. Your Kapler is an English spy, he's been arrested. When Svetlana tried to defend herself, proclaiming that they were in love, Stalin mocked her, repeating her words back, according to Svetlana's memoirs, with hatred of the very word love. He slapped her face. Take a look at yourself, who'd want you? He then read their love letters, 
Kapler was sentenced to five years. In truth, as you're probably thinking, he was lucky not to be shot, and even managed to survive the war. Svetlana would later say that her father had overreacted. His actions weren't untypical for fathers at that time, and unfortunately probably the same tawdry scene plays out in countless different places today when girls start dating and their fathers disapprove. But history does not permit Stalin a single relationship, untainted by his paranoia and lack of empathy. At the front, the defeat of Paulus was a crushing blow for the German forces. Their big, strategic summer offensive had failed in its main objective, and soon winter arrived again, rendering additional offensive operations impossible. Every day that passed, more Red Army soldiers were massing on the fronts, and their industrial production was outstripping the Nazis. After Stalingrad, with a few notable exceptions, it was defeat for the Wehrmacht. Stalin was immensely pleased with the victory, and wore the field marshal uniform for all of his public appearances after the victory at Stalingrad. This military honour reflected Stalin's enhanced sense of pride, but probably to the deep relief of Marshal Zhukov and others in high command. Stalin did not now believe himself to be an infallible military genius. When the Nazi forces reorganised after the defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler looked to another great summer offensive. He could not, would not sue for peace, but every delay made it more likely that the Soviets would build up numerical superiority. Stalin, bombastic as ever in victory, was keen on a massive Red Army summer offensive, but Zhukov dissuaded him. He had correctly anticipated where the next offensive would come. Stalin for once trusted his generals and his spy network that told him that forces were concentrated around the Kursk salient. It made strategic sense for Hitler to attack here. It was a bulge of Soviet territory into the Nazi-occupied region, and the plan was to cut this bulge off and trap forces in another massive encirclement. Stalin, keen on the counterattack, wanted to concentrate offensive forces in this region and attempt to encircle the Wehrmacht. But Zhukov warned that this would be playing into the German hands. Listening to his general, they instead pursued a strategy of defence in depth, layer upon layer of mines, anti-tank guns and artillery where they knew the attack would come. This time, the Blitzkrieg tactics encountered 190 miles of defences and massive reserves of Soviet tanks. In the largest armoured engagement in history, over the space of a month, the two armies smashed into each other. Soviet losses were immense and far outstripped the Germans in terms of the number of men and tanks. They lost five times as many tanks by some estimates. But the Germans also suffered heavy losses and failed to win the battle, achieving none of their objectives. The Nazis simply didn't have the men to lose. The Battle of Kursk was Hitler's last great offensive on the Eastern Front, and his last chance to win the war. And, despite the immense sacrifice of the Red Army, he had failed. From this point on, the Nazi armies were incapable of taking the initiative, and simply had to react to the Red Army's advance. The bloody meat grinder of the Eastern Front would continue for another two years, with unimaginable suffering on both sides, as things got more and more desperate. But it was clear, from the day of Kursk onwards, that there would be no decisive victory for the Nazis. Around the same time, the Western Allies were opening up new fronts against the German army with the invasion of Italy. Rommel was being driven out of North Africa. Preparations were beginning for the D-Day invasion of France, and we'll talk a bit more later on about Stalin negotiating with the other powers in the alliance. As important as these operations were, and they did divert a great deal of German military might from the Eastern Front, the attritional grind and dramatic battles of the Eastern Front were the decisive factors in the Second World War. Before Britain and America take too much credit for defeating the Nazis, we do well to remember that when the D-Day landings happened, there were 58 Nazi divisions in France and Italy. There were 228 in the Soviet Union and on the Eastern Front. The entire Western theatre of the war saw fewer casualties than Stalingrad alone. At unimaginable human cost, and in many ways despite his inept military interventions and his terror policies, Stalin and the Red Army were going to be victorious. During the war, as we have discussed, political repression continued, especially against anyone who was considered a deserter or a defeatist. But in other ways, Stalin relaxed his policies in order to win the war, specifically when it came to culture and the economy. The national anthem of the Soviet Union 
had been changed to the Internationale, that hymn to the International Workers' Revolution. Stalin had it replaced with a more patriotic song about the motherland and Russia, albeit one that contained the lines, Stalin brought us up, inspired us to loyalty towards the people, towards labour and heroic feats. He also critically relaxed persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church, realising that in wartime people would need the comfort of religion. It's also the case that practically every army in history has had some element of propaganda that God was on their side. It kind of reminds me of a quote I saw from a British soldier in World War I. God must think us all a right bunch of fools. He can't be on both sides. Even in the census taken at the height of the terror, 55% of people willingly declared themselves religious, risking persecution. Surely even more than that lied about their faith. In spite of everything, all the propaganda, all the persecutions, Stalin, the ex-choir boy, the ex-trainee priest, who'd rejected religion, was not able to mould the minds of his people. The one thing they can never take away from you is the cubic inches inside your skull. Around the time of Kursk, he met with the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, effectively the key church leader, the equivalent of the Orthodox Pope, although I won't say that directly because otherwise I'll get letters. He jovially asked why the patriarch hadn't brought more priests with him. You get the sense he was pretending that the massive arrests and executions just didn't happen. In their negotiations, Stalin allowed religious buildings to reopen for worship purposes, and he stopped persecution of the church. The church, in return, as the state religion had done in the days of the Tsars, supported the wars and helped to prop up the regime's morality. The appeals to patriotism and to religion, instead of Marxist-Leninist ideology and the glory of communism in the party, are clear, pragmatic indications of Stalin's concessions to reality. But as we see so many times with Stalin, his pragmatism never indicates a change of heart, never a real shift in policy. He makes concessions only where he can see that he has no choice, that it strengthens his own position to do so, and always with an eye to increase control. The Orthodox Church that he encouraged was very supportive of the regime, and closely monitored. Free enterprise was tolerated, but the government was still requisitioning resources for the military. In the same way as the workers in the factories and fields were allowed just enough food for them to survive, with the rest going to the army, he perhaps allowed people just enough spiritual succour and patriotism to survive, before snatching it back after the war. And, as the Lend-Lease programme from the Americans meant that high-quality jeeps and other vehicles were being used by the Soviet military, Stalin made it a crime to complement the works of the capitalist bourgeoisie. He might have been allied with liberal Western democracies, and next episode we'll talk about the meetings with Roosevelt and Churchill, but he was never going to allow his society to resemble them, nor concede that they might be superior in any way. If he needed to appear more liberal than he was, to allow the Allies to rehabilitate him as, quote, Uncle Joe, it was a necessary evil. And it worked too. Time magazine named him Person of the Year in 1942. If anyone in particular needs any indication that being named Person of the Year by Time magazine does not necessarily make you a decent person, there you have it. They described, Host Stalin drank his vodka straight and talked the same way. Only Stalin knew how close Russia stood to defeat in 1942, and how fully he brought Russia through. It is incredibly difficult to get a grasp on Stalin's personality, because he was capable of being so many things to so many people. It would be easy for me to portray him as any one of a number of caricatures. Was he a charming manipulator, who knew how to use force to get his own way when necessary, playing off his subordinates against each other? Was he a bloodthirsty tyrant concerned with nothing more than personal power? A paranoid, red czar, armed with modern methods of repression? Was he a Marxist ideologue, like Lenin, determined that he was constructing a better world? and that only by destroying every possible saboteur could he create that world? Was he an insane killer and sadist, whose capricious, cruel, oscillating moods, intense and unjustified self-confidence, and mad conspiracy theories wrecked the lives of millions? <laughs>
Was he a man so damaged by personal tragedy that he was incapable of feeling empathy for anyone? Did he have a fanatical sense of his own destiny? Was he concerned with leaving a great legacy? A control freak, an egomaniac, an empire builder? Did he buy into the cult of personality that he invented around himself? All of these characterizations have aspects that fit, and then aspects that don't. He relished the role of the wise, cunning statesman and diplomat that the Western media gave him during the alliance, even though his Marxism meant that he should have nothing but contempt for the capitalist nations. No single portrayal seems to fit, and so we have no choice but to throw up our hands and say what people least like to say when they're trying to construct a narrative out of the bizarreness of life. It's complicated. Through any war, but particularly in the case of the Great Patriotic War, as it came to be known in Russia, we need to be aware of a dramatic disconnect. When the Bolsheviks ran the state like a military, albeit a chaotic, neurotic one at times, they invited the same disconnect. People sit in offices, look at maps, and consider that an offensive in such and such a sector would be strategically useful, or dictate that such and such a line must be held at any cost. And on the ground, in reality, people die en masse. Single orders dictated by Stalin, the not one step back order, the order that referred to anyone taken prisoner as a malicious deserter, the consequences of these diktats on the ground were, more often than not, mass executions. Not just of soldiers and prisoners of war, but of innocents too. There were terrible atrocities committed on both sides during the war, such as accounts of prisoners being executed by being hosed down in the Russian winter so as not to waste bullets on them. As the fighting grew more and more bitter, the violence escalated. But as we know, one death is a tragedy. A million deaths? I cannot begin to understand the suffering caused by Hitler and Stalin during the Second World War. If you go down the trends and forces approach to history, and argue that war was inevitable without these two dictators at the helm of vast armies, you may well be right, but you can't deny the specific ideologies and idiosyncrasies of these men made the war far bloodier and more brutal than it would otherwise have been. Again, I feel the sense that there's nothing good that can come of this knowledge unless we all remember the possible consequences of dehumanising other people. But I don't feel like there can be any explanation, any rationalisation. Every life is a perspective as infinite and complex as your own, a world unto itself. To see it become so cheap, there's nothing there but a vast sadness. In the best of all possible worlds, these things would never have happened. That's not where we live. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. If you've enjoyed this episode, you can do all the usual things that help support the show. Email us, Twitter, Facebook. You can donate to the show, visit the website. Next time, we'll talk about the end of the war and then loop back around to discuss the diplomacy that Stalin was undertaking. In the Big Three conferences with Roosevelt and Churchill, they negotiated the carve-up of the whole world. Until then, what else is there to say? Be kind to each other.